Um, Tam is going to speak to us today about uh, renewable energy and the transformation of America. Um, can we get the screen on, please? Um, and I'll just say that I, I'm, I'm not Matt Glanz, by the way. I'm Julian Morris, and I run International Policy Network. <laughs> Here we go. Thank you very much for having me. I want to clarify up front that I'm actually a pro-renewables guy, so you hear, hear a different um, analysis right here. And I want to kind of um, say up front that I think um, a lot of the debate right now about um, climate change, uh, cap and trade, cap and tax, et cetera, really goes to how you see the future and the cost of fossil fuels. And so I haven't actually read Ben's analysis in detail, but I know enough from what he said that uh, he, and I, he and I would disagree a lot on the future prices of oil, natural gas, and coal. And um, I asked Ben, actually, in a sidebar, where he, why he thinks prices skyrocketed in 05 to 08 for oil, coal, and natural gas. There are some underlying themes here I'll go into later in my presentation about the, that uh, trend. So I'm going to talk about renewables. And um, I want to kind of stress here that I'm going to focus on wind power and solar power, but primarily on wind. And uh, wind right now is booming around the country. Last year was a record year for wind in the U.S. and around the world um, more generally. Um, Illinois is seeing some of this boom. We had a 300 megawatt farm come on um, this year, uh, Cuyahoga Ridge. And so farmers and um, owners around the country are benefiting from wind power and other renewables in many ways already. I want to also kind of um, highlight this trend uh, is really not um, well examined so far in the media. This is kind of a pretty um, interesting theme not looked at so far by a lot of folks. Um, who knew that emissions dropped last year by 7%? Anyone? A few? OK. Do you know why? Recession. Wrong. <laughs> Wrong. I'll show you why. This is actually from the EIA, the official um, agency that looks at this. And so you have um, a long-term trend of improving energy intensity. So if every unit of GDP you produce, you're using yet less energy to get that unit of GDP. This is a positive trend, and it's happening naturally. You also have improving carbon intensity, meaning every unit of energy produced is using less carbon for a lot of reasons, including renewables and more efficiency. So in fact, the EI um, calculated that two-thirds of that drop last year is non-recession related. That's very good news. And if that trend continues for a long time, we get to a very good place in the future with um, minimal pain and a lot of good. So where, where are solar and wind right now? I'm going to give you some background, and then I'm going to talk about um, where we go through 2030. So U.S. solar growth rates um, have been on a tear. Uh, from 2000 to 2008, we went from the blue line, 200 megawatts of solar, to about 1,800 megawatts of solar. The green line is solar thermal. So an exponential trend. Again, positive, costs are coming down. Uh, people are getting more excited about the economics of it and, of course, being more aware about the problems. And frankly, it's kind of nice if you're a homeowner to have your own power source. If you look at wind growth rates, it's even better. You have from 2000, about 3,000 megawatts of wind through 2010, or sorry, 20, 2009, uh, 38, 39,000 megawatts of wind. Um, last year was a record year. You had 10,000 megawatts come online. That's enough for about 3 million homes. So it's a lot of wind power. It's not a hobby industry anymore. It's a real industry. Um, by state, Texas is the obvious leader, about 10,000 megawatts. And that's in just 10 years. Iowa is second. California third. In fact, California led the way until about 2006. But it's been resting its laurels now for a long time. Those wind farms were built in the 80s and 90s. In the last 10 years, we've stagnated. So Texas has actually taken the lead in the last 10 years in a very obvious and manifest way. And then Illinois is um, six down here with about 2,000 megawatts. Now, by state, in terms of the uh, percent from wind power, it's a different kind of picture. You have uh, Minnesota and Iowa leading the way with about 7% coming from wind. So again, not a hobby industry. That's a major power source. Um, Illinois, 1%. Colorado, 6%. Texas, 3.5%. California, about 3%. It's a long way to go, but certainly, again, it's a significant and substantial power source already. Globally, um, again, the same kind of trend, exponential growth for solar, going from about 500 megawatts in 95 to about 16,500 megawatts at the end of 08. The key thing here is exponential growth rates. 
Globally, wind power, 09 a record year. We added about 35,000 megawatts globally last year, enough again for about 10 million homes. And then where are we going? Um, this is from um, a national, sorry, a global wind group that puts out a report each year looking at the um, state of the industry and where we're going. And they show that 09 was the year which Asia became the biggest wind power market. And that's primarily China. India is second place. Uh, and then the blue bar here is Europe, the green bar, North America. When you go to 2014 on the right, you can see that trend is exacerbated. So Asia is, in fact, widening its lead. And China added last year 13,000 megawatts of wind. They're still a much smaller economy than the US. We added 10,000 megawatts. So they're already actually way ahead of us now on wind. So this is not just about, um, in fact, it's not about climate change at all. You can kind of make that argument. It's about economic competitiveness. This is the way of the future. So if you want to stay on that leading edge as a nation, be competitive. A lot of your reasons to uh, maintain your industries in wind and solar power. So where are we in the US now in terms of the actual uh, capacity? We have about 3% renewable power in the US, excluding big hydro. When you put in big hydro, it's about 10%. So still, you know, a small minority. So where do we go from here? When you look at the uh, growth rates in the last 10 years, about 40% for solar power growth, 30 for wind, you get an average doubling time of about two years. So who knows what Moore's Law is? A lot of people. So Moore's Law in computing is that basically computing power doubles about every two years. And that's been a trend for the last 60 years. So we have now, you know, a trillion times more computing power than back in 1950 when Moore came up with the law. When you look at renewable power and you have a doubling trend from here to 2030, you actually get to about half renewable power by 2030 under today's trends. So my main thesis today is that we need a revolution, and we're actually seeing it already. And if we can continue current growth trends, we get to a very sizable percentage of power by 2030 globally. And of course, the US is part of that. So there was actually a big report that came out in 2008 from the US Department of Energy looking at how we get to 20% wind by 2030. And they project each year, you need X megawatts per year. And they actually show through 2020 an increasing trend, and then it kind of levels off through 2030, kind of rests at the same growth rate. We are, in fact, five years ahead of schedule. We installed 10,000 megawatts last year. This report assumes 10,000 megawatts comes online in 2014. So again, some good news based on existing policies, existing industries. The cost. You know, today's panel is about cost. And so, again, I would um, respectfully differ from Ben's analysis on the costs here. Um, you can actually look at the costs of wind power historically. This right here looks at the projected costs, and I'll talk about historical costs in a second. This, again, is in USDOE. And they project a 20% wind scenario requires a 2% incremental cost by 2030. That amounts to 50 cents per household per month in the US. I would argue that's acceptable, personally. I would also argue this is a very conservative analysis, because this analysis assumes, essentially, level costs for oil, coal, and natural gas through 2030. And I think that's very optimistic. More detail here, the cost of wind power for 20% by 2030. <laughs> They actually did a detailed analysis looking at you know, all the sites throughout the US, land-based, shallow offshore, deep offshore. And land-based, they concluded, would be about 9 cents per kilowatt hour, or $90 per megawatt hour, for that whole resource, up to 8,000 gigawatts. Again, we added 10,000 megawatts last year, so gigawatt is 1,000 megawatts. We have more than enough wind resource in our country to power ourselves many times over. And this analysis shows you can do it, in fact, fairly affordably. When you go offshore, it gets more expensive. You might have heard about Cape Wind being approved last week, and a, a PPA, a contract to sell the power, being requested at about 19, or sorry, 21 cents per kilowatt hour. Offshore wind is more expensive. And so onshore wind is obviously the low-hanging fruit, but we certainly need to have an offshore wind strategy also. So that's a projection. You can say, well, projections can be you know, way off and often are, usually are. What about historically? 
uh, wind power prices historically have, in fact, been cheaper. This shows, this is a report from um, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. They put it out each year. And the um, kind of mauve bar here is um, the wholesale power prices in um, average of the uh, U.S. markets. The uh, red dots are the average cost of wind power contracts from the sample they have, which is fairly big. It's not all wind power projects because not all um, power contracts are made public. They do their best here. They have about uh, 400 projects in, in the uh, database through 2008. So on the left is 03, on the right is 08, and they show that basically every year uh, since it began keeping this data, wind power prices have been lower than the average wholesale price. And this is not entirely apples to apples. In fact, it's probably unfair to win because wholesale power prices are short-term power prices, and therefore they're cheaper. When you have 10, 20-year contracts, you get a higher price of win because you're locking in that price. So uh, uncertainty, risk is reduced, therefore the price has increased a bit. But even so, you still have a very favorable comparison here. And then looking at um, one year, um, 2008, looking at each region, you get a similar analysis. So looking at the heartland here, you have 28 projects in a database. The, uh, again, the kind of mauve bar is the average wholesale price, and the red bar is the average wind price. You can see in every market in 08, you had a lower price for average wind power prices than the wholesale power prices. Now, of course, you can argue about tax incentives and subsidies. And that's actually a more detailed analysis, which is, which is more um, project-specific and region-specific. But more generally, if you include all the subsidies for every technology, it's actually about the same, because every technology has some subsidies. OK, so in terms of reaching this wind power goal, the main problem looking forward is maintaining today's growth trend. Today's growth trend is very positive, very encouraging. But can we keep on going that way? And I would say under today's uh, trends for transmission access and permitting and siting and NIMBYism, probably not. Economically, yes. But in terms of the other factors, probably not. So transmission access is a huge issue. And the same report looked at what we need to achieve this 20% goal by 2030. And the green lines are um, ultra high voltage power lines that need to be built throughout the US, uh, 765 kV. Very ambitious, uh, costs about $43 billion net present value, incremental costs on top of business as usual. Um, permitting, more generally, big problem. Uh, Cape Wind. Nine years in permitting. Nimism is rampant for any power project, especially large wind projects and uh, transmission lines. Anyone heard of Banana? Build absolutely nothing anywhere near anything? This is California. So it's a major problem. So I mean, I, I live in California. I develop projects. And um, I mean, it's, I'm being a bit harsh, but it's sort of true in many situations. It's very, very hard to permit. Uh, projects like this in some places in our country. And places like the UK are seeing a backlash and uh, Europe more generally. So a major problem. So the area I focus on personally in my day job is um, community scale renewables. And I define these as basically 1 to 20 megawatts enough for 200 to 5,000 homes. So kind of medium scale, manageable. You don't need new transmission lines. Permitting is not as big a deal because people aren't shocked by seeing five wind turbines rather than, say, 500. Uh, local job growth, you can actually um, own these um, locally. You know, I'm talking to foundations in my region about um, owning these projects to benefit our communities. A um, lot of benefits. You're just localizing resources. And you, frankly, you look up and see the wind farm or the solar farms, and you're reminded of the effects of our power use. That's a good thing. Just a few examples. This is a five megawatt farm in the UK, three megawatts in Wisconsin, uh, 10 megawatt solar in Germany. That takes about 100 acres or so. Um, solar City, six megawatts in Arizona. So again, this area is booming. Um, Europe's kind of led the way on this model. Denmark uh, with wind, the Danish model, uh, Germany for solar. And then Minnesota has been a leader uh, in wind. And in Ontario now is a leader uh, for solar. Um, kind of ironically, because of course Ontario is not particularly sunny, but they have prioritized um, renewables. And they have a new program. It's called a feed-in tariff. 
and a feed-in tariff is simply a guaranteed price paid for renewables if you meet certain criteria. So it gives market certainty, and anyone can own a project and bid it into the system. So this is a map of their recent program, and they're getting thousands of um, proposals, and they've got about four times more contracts signed up than they expected. And um, this is a model um, that, in fact, began in the U.S. Um, under PERPA back in 1978. And then Germany took it and ramped it up. And they have been the market leader in solar for the last 10 years because of that, and also in wind until um, the U.S. and China kind of lapped them again. Uh, but in terms of community-scale renewables, a feed-in tariff is really key because if you're a smaller company, don't have a lot of, you know, uh, a deep pocket basically to finance various ventures that may fail, uh, you need to have some kind of certainty that you can actually sell that power at a certain price. So it basically gets over that initial hump of uh, development costs and uncertainty. And the question really is where you set that price. You can set a feed-in tariff price too high, like Spain did, and they got too many renewables, and they had to say, whoa, 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 let's back it off. And so they went from 08 to having the biggest market in the world for solar to 09, where it went to about one-fourth of the size. So certainly getting the policies and the prices right is a key piece, and certainly is not entirely a market-friendly policy. But again, if you're looking at the overall benefits and the pros and cons, um, I think a feed-in tariff is worth it. So I'm going to end um, on kind of a, a less positive um, note here, unfortunately. That Again, I want to ask, who heard about the um, World Energy Outlook 2008's warning about climate change and peak oil? OK, if you OK, good. More than your average audience. This is a major document because the um, International Energy Agency, which is the official watchdog of the rich nations, uh, formed back in the 70s after the oil crises, puts out a major report each year looking at the state of our energy. In 08, they for the first time looked at um, the supply side, and they also looked at climate change. So they looked at the top 800 oil fields around the world and said, okay, what in fact are depletion rates, and what are new discovery rates, and where are we going for oil? And they also looked at, cl looked at climate change, what we had to do to achieve this 450 parts per million scenario. And they concluded that the decline rate for today's oil fields was about twice what was the average um, assumption. So rather than 3% a year or 3.5% a year, they found about 7% a year decline rates. So their main conclusion was that by 2030, we need nine new Saudi Arabias to meet oil demand. Again, nine new Saudi Arabias. And frankly, that's simply not going to happen. So you're going to see supply-constrained price increases like we had in 08, which is not an anomaly. It's part of the long-term trend, which right now is being masked by global recession. If we start recovering again, I guarantee you, prices will skyrocket again. So that's the long-term trend. So I'm going to read this quote because it's important. Um, Current global trends in energy supply and consumption are patently unsustainable. The future of human, sorry, human prosperity depends on how successfully we tackle the two central energy challenges facing us today, securing the supply of reliable and affordable energy and affecting a rapid transformation to a low-carbon, efficient, and environmentally benign system of energy supply. What is needed is nothing short of an energy revolution. So I've tried to show you today that we actually are in the midst of a revolution, a quiet revolution. If we can simply sustain current growth rates for renewables, with wind and solar leading the way, we will actually achieve what the IA is calling for. Thank you. <laughs>